And when I became a binge drinker, my life was literally broken down into how many binges did I have that year. What does a loved one do to help that person transition out and be free? So when a person says, my husband is choosing to drink over our relationship, you have to eliminate that from your thought process because the people who've gone through addiction, this is not a choice. Nobody is asked for this to happen. This is not his fault. We're driving home and he says, hey, Pat, how come you're not saying anything to me? I said, you know, just to be honest with me, I just see you being a pain and I hope you realize there's value to life. I don't know how to help you. That is the best and most honest and supportive thing you can do to a loved one who's suffering. Is alcohol adversely affecting any part of your life? If the answer is yes, then you need to address it. My guest today is Claudia Christian, which by the way, if you, if you go in there and do research on her story as an actress and what she's done and the life you've li she's lived, you will be so curious on what we can learn from her because she did a TEDx talk uh, a, a few years ago. I don't know if it was two years ago, three years ago on how she dealt openly. She came out and talked about how she dealt with uh, uh, AUD uh, and how she relapsed 20 times and how she even went and tried a lot of different programs. And even once she spent $30,000 in a program, and I, this is very close to me because I've dealt with uh, many close friends and family of mine who have struggled with this. But prior to getting into the interview, let me just read to you what her book, Babylon Confidential, a memoir of love, sex, and addiction, how it describes her life. Then you're going to see where we're going to go with this. So from the set of Dallas to her starring role on the sci-fi series, Babylon 5, Claudia's affairs with billionaires, supermodels, rock stars, and celebrities are mixed with shooting, stalking, heartbreak, and betrayal. Onset and off drama follows Claudia, an alcohol feud fueled coke run and make out session with a bridesmaid on her wedding day. Her, uh, temp uh, tempest uh, her love hate relationship with actor Agnes McFadden, the conspiracy theories surrounding her ex husband, and uh, her relationship with billionaire Dottie Fight, who's from Egypt, Middle Eastern, uh, before he dated. Princess Diana, Hollywood life takes on a toll on Claudia as she descends into alcohol addiction and desperate battle to reclaim her life. The reason why I'm reading this is because I asked permission before I read this. I spent going article after article after article. And I think who we have today is somebody that can save many people's lives. Every year, 100,000 people in America die due to alcoholism worldwide, 3 million. And that's a real number. That's 5.3% of all cause of death around the world every year is due to alcoholism and she's doing something about it. With that being said, Claudia, thank you so much for being a guest on Valuetainment. It is my absolute pleasure. Thank you. Yes. And, and I appreciate you going out there, you know, talking about it years ago when, uh, who was it? I think it was Gerald Ford's uh, wife when she came out and she it Betty used to be Ford. Betty Ford when it was very much of a, a secret thing that nobody would talk about. Yeah. And she has a facility in in uh, Palm Desert. I think it's in Palm Desert or Indian Wells. And uh, people swear by it. So for you to be able to do that, I know it's been a, a positive impact in many other people's lives. But before we go into that, why don't we kind of go into your story? Because your story is so, so many different angles. We can go with your story. So before anything, I'll just let you tell us, uh, Claudia, if I was in high school with you and we were 14 years old, Yes. If I'm sitting next to you in high school and I'm classmates with you, who was Claudia in high school? Claudia in high school was uh, a 45 year old trapped in a 14 year old's body, desperate to get out of high school. Um, she took extra courses, worked five jobs, uh, sold sports equipment, worked in a cafe, getting her butt pinched by the manager just to make enough money to move the hell out of ho the house and become an actress in LA. So my impetus as, as a 14 year old, uh, my virginity at 14 had just been taken by a molester uh, who lived next door to us. We moved to a new high school. So I was 15 in a new high school and away from that rapist. So I was in probably a very vulnerable position but I was extremely focused and a very tough kid. So I really never dealt with that trauma. I went straight into the next school and my plan was to get out as soon as possible. I had an amazing guidance counselor who got me a scholarship and got me enough credits to graduate with a GED by the time I was 16 and a half years old when I moved to Los Angeles. 
So if you had met me in high school, I wanted nothing to do with anybody. I wanted to get out. I didn't want anything to do with the high school experience. I was an adult. I had a checking account. I had a plan. I wanted to be on TV and I was focused as hell. When did that happen? When did you know what you wanted to do? Very, very young in life. I, um, I did some theater as a, as a little child and I was very shy. I had tinnitus. I had um, difficulties with my hearing. And I remember being on stage and everything disappeared. And I was focused and I, was, I felt that I could move people. I was a really highly sensitive child. So when I saw people listening or laughing or even shedding a tear when during the production, I was, I was really, that was it for me. I thought, wow, I can communicate this way with people. Um, so I fell in love with performing as a child and then subsequently really didn't know how that would transform my life or how I would get into it. And then we were transferred to California and I thought, well, this is God's plan <laughs> to put me near Los Angeles because it wasn't going to happen in Westport, Connecticut. But, uh, yeah, so it, I mean, that sounds very myopic and kind of, uh, conceited, but, but, you know, children don't have that. Um, in general, don't have that fear of failure. All I knew was this is what I wanted to do, so I'm going to make it happen. And I, you know, I, I, wow. I think that that's probably why I succeeded, is because I didn't really know I could fail. <laughs> you know, this was my dream, and Am I wanted to do it. Amazing. And wasn't wasn't uh, uh, Marilyn Monroe also known as being highly sensitive as well? Like we, she could, you know, she would move and feel and you know respond to all the different reactions people were having. Do, do you? Do you see that as a common trait with those who become very good actors and actresses? I think that a lot of artists are empaths and that we absorb pain from other people and we can sense when someone is uncomfortable. I mean, and we can read people. So I would agree that I, a lot of my, my actor friends and writer friends are very sensitive people. Um, does that necessarily equate to being a good actor? No, not necessarily, but um, it's, it definitely tends to also make you take a lot on. And I, and I think artists are drawn to that. We have pain and, you know, this is an expression of our, our, our need to communicate, our need to show our pain. So it's, it's quite exquisite when you get a role, for instance, that you can dive into that, that madness or that shame or something because it's cathartic. So, so this is almost therapy. Um, you know, it's when you get a really good role, it's, it's therapeutic on a daily basis. So when you left at 16 and, and you're deciding to go pursue your dreams and be an actress yourself, you know, when, what, when did you land something when you said, I think, I think I'm in this thing now, what, which one was it when you're like, I, I think, I think this could lead into a real career. I, I was so fortunate. I met a manager and I talked her into signing me <laughs> for a three-year deal um, I did all these things, which used to be called in the industry, go sees back in the old days, the eighties, the casting directors would see new actresses and have take meetings with them to see if they could cast them in the future. So I was lucky. I, I made the rounds in, in Los Angeles through the work of this manager. And eventually when I turned 18, uh, because I looked much older, I was very tall. I had a deep voice still even then. Um, so I had to wait till I was 18 to play, you know, 18. Um, yeah, the second I turned 18, I had a job lined up on Dallas. I mean, the, the five and under, and then the next thing I had Falcon Crest, and then I had a TV series called Behringer's. By the time I was 18, I was making six figures. Wow. It just happened. Yeah, and I mean, Dallas, uh, for everybody to, you know, uh, uh, I remember watching Dallas when we were in Germany, and Dallas was like, if you're on Dallas, everybody follow Dallas. How would you compare what Dallas is today? Because everybody in the world was following Dallas. It's for like... It's as iconic as Friends or Seinfeld. I mean, everybody watched Dallas. Everybody was riveted to it. I had a very small scene, but it was the top of its game. I mean, Larry Hagman directed it. It was the very first television show I ever did. So, you know, the catering was, was, was amazing. You know, it was like steak and lobster. I mean, everything was, to start there uh, yeah. was kind of rough because subsequently over the years doing indie films in, in uh, you know, in, in Eastern European countries and so forth, <laughs> you know, you have to get, you have to sort of take, take, uh, take everything with a grain of salt and know that nothing would be quite that glamorous as that first job. Out of all the work you did and all the different kinds of movies you did, what, what format was your favorite? Was it more doing the uh, two hour feature where you're going out, you're going to be with your team for a while? Was it more the sitcoms where you're kind of going in and 
uh, how that format was, was it more the independent film side? Which one was your favorite? When you got a job, you're like, I'm excited about this one here. I was always excited to get a, a studio film or something, but to be honest with you, I love being on a series because it's, it becomes your family and, and it's, it gives your life structure. You don't, you're not looking for a job anymore. You're, you're, you're home, you know, you know where you're gonna work this day, this day of that week. You've got your script, you, have, you fall in love with your character, you work on your correct character, you develop it through the seasons. So for me, series work has always been the most gratifying. And, but I mean, I'm, I'm a person who, who likes that regular work. Um, you know, and it's, 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 I'm, I've done a lot of television. So I think that's my, my wheelhouse, my, you know, I'm not, not to say that I didn't love doing a movie of the week or a feature and going to, you know, someplace and shooting a film. It was marvelous. Get to know people and you're out in a month or a 45 day shoot or a 20 day shoot. Yeah, that's fun too. But I like, I like coming home every day to the same crew, the same makeup artist, you know, shooting the breeze with the same people because it really does. I'm still friends with people that I did series with in the nineties because we became so close pre cell phone days, of course, <laughs> cell phone days, pre -cell -phone pre -cell -phone days, days. people talked <laughs> the days where we were free because now oh. you have to stay on top of everything and oh, no. everything's being documented today. So whatever you're doing, there's 330 million cameras around you nonstop recording everything you're doing. It's a different time we're living in. Let me tell you how grateful I am that I didn't have the worst of my alcohol problem nowadays, where there's a camera on you everywhere, because people would have shame, shame inducing video on me, I'm sure, because, you know, but luckily I didn't, they didn't have smartphones when I was really suffering. So that's something I think about a lot because it's such an invasion to people who are suffering right now. We don't need to see a picture of them walking into the rehab facility. It's really not our business. You know, and everything is so public now and, and seeing people, you know, coming out of surgery or out of hospital or out of detox, it's really unfair. It's such an invasion and it's just normal now. We, we, make, we make fun of people going into, into treatment, you know, with late night comedians sit there and say, oh, it's the eighth time they've gone in. That's not funny. It's not funny. They're dying. They're suffering. You know, you, you, you wouldn't laugh at people who have eight rounds of chemo you know, but we laugh at people who consistently seek treatment and it's not, it's really not funny. And it's because it's so public and it's so, it's so um, acceptable to shame people nowadays with photos, video, with, with articles. I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. And it's, um, I mean, I go back to the army and I think about myself when guys say, so Pat, you know, you, you don't drink a lot. How come you're not a guy that drinks? You know, I'll have an old fashioned every other week if I'm sitting with somebody and I'll, I'll have a cigar with a friend or something like that. But in the army, let me tell you, I was competing. I was trying to see if I can finish all the Jack and Coke in the world and see if I can do it all by myself. And I was hanging out with Jose uh, on Friday night and Saturday for two and a half years straight. And uh, in my family in the Middle East, growing up in Iran, alcohol was like a cool thing. You drank because you were cool and everybody was doing it. And then eventually you saw how it uh, took some people's lives, personal lives, their sanity, their freedoms, and some couldn't even drop it. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to friends uh, where the first time, even when I was going through it with one of my friends, he couldn't stop drinking alcohol. I said, why don't you just quit? What's the big deal, right? You kind of say comments like that. You don't know their pain. So eventually one of my friends who was going through it bad, I was at the prison to pick him up. I'm sitting outside till three o'clock in the morning. Finally, he gets out, gets in a car. This was like his fourth or fifth UI. And we're driving home and I don't say anything to him. And he says, uh, hey, Pat, how come you're not saying anything to me? I said, I said, you know, just to be honest with me, I just see you being in pain. I just want to see you get out of this thing. I don't know what you're going through, but you're in pain. And I hope you realize there's value to life. I don't know how to help you. I don't have a method. The only thing I know is what I've seen others go through, whether it's AA and all these other programs. But uh, I hope you figure out a way to get through this. And eventually he figured out a way to get through it. And he's doing great. He's changed his life, you know, in a completely different way. But many Wait, people don't get to that point. That, yeah, but what you said to him, people should be aware of that. That is love and support and what most people do is say why can't you just stop well ask somebody why can't you stop breathing when you have a compulsive disorder of the brain it's not logical why would i put a poison into my body that is ruining my life 
that's not logical. So to tell me to stop is not, doesn't make sense. Clearly there's something wrong with my brain. Sure. Yeah. I've learned this compulsive disorder. So for you to say to your friend, you know, I see that you're in pain and I just want to support you. That is, that is the best and most honest and supportive thing you can do to a loved one who's suffering. That is, that is wonderful. And you did, and you were honest, you didn't know how to help him, but you were there as a friend. You picked him up. You didn't shame him. You didn't judge him. That's wonderful. What, what Claudia, what was that movie where the husband, his wife was an alcoholic and she couldn't help himself. And the husband was a sweet husband and she kept relapsing. Meg Ryan. Was Andy, it, Garcia? Andy Garcia. Is it Meg Ryan? And when, and, a man, when a man loves a woman. She's, that's the one. Yeah. Oh my God. The clink cl throwing the bottles out and the recycling yeah. thing and the door locks behind her. Boy, whew, that was <laughs> anybody who's, who's suffered through alcohol use disorder will know that will know those little signs. No, it's, it's very sad because most people are shared that, that this, this, all they know is the 12 step world. And because that is what is predominantly used despite the fact that alcohol deaths are increasing. COVID has seen a massive uptick of alcohol use disorders, especially amongst women. We still lose 100,000 people a day, three and a half million in the world every year. It still costs the US $225 billion a year alcohol misuse. And we're still using this antiquated peer support, which is not a medical treatment, yeah. even though we have sex, six medicines that address alcohol use disorder. So when people say, you know, well, I don't just go to a meeting or do this or just quit or just say no, it's flying in the face of everything we know about addiction, which it is, it is not something you can control or be mindful or willpower your way through it or white knuckle your way through it. A very small percentage of individuals in the world can quit anything on their own. That's about 8% of the population. And if you look at the success rates of 12 step programs, it's about less than 5%. But the really sad statistic is that only 10% of people suffering from an alcohol use disorder seek treatment. And out of that 10, out of those 10% of the people, only one will have any form of long-term success. Out of 10%, only one will have success. Yes. And that means 90% of people yeah. who are suffering right now aren't going to seek treatment. And you know why they're not going to seek treatment? What's because that? they've been told that all they can do is quit and go to meetings for the rest of their huh. life. And that doesn't appeal to a 30-year-old or a 20-year-old or anybody, I mean, the majority of people, they want their life back. They don't want to be told that this is, this is what they have to do and they don't want to live with cravings for the rest of their life. Claudia, do you mind sharing with the audience uh, uh, how it happened? Because the way you described it in my 20s, it was just what, in my 30s, later in my 40s, I'm like, I'm the last guy. Can you kind of go through your experience, how that happened to you? Sure, it is a learned behavior. So, so most people don't just go to a bar and have a drink and suddenly they're addicted to alcohol. And it's clearly not a choice. You don't say, well, I wanna wake up and be an alcoholic. So what happens is if you have the genetic predisposition and you engage in the behavior, you have a, a higher chance of, of developing an alcohol use disorder over time, especially if you start drinking before your brain is fully developed around your early 20s. So here we have me, I'm drinking in my 20s very lightly. I mean, for my, like for me to split a bottle of wine with somebody was a big Saturday night of drinking. That's two glasses. I mean, then that was like, wow, I've had enough. So I was normal. And then in my thirties, I was normal until my late thirties, st it started escalating. I was hanging around with a lot of wine collectors. You know, it was that time of, uh, in society when people were smoking cigars and drinking wine. And, and you know, it was, it was very acceptable. I had a lot of friends who you would now call partiers. I had a wine collection and it escalated from a couple times a month to a couple times a week to now four day, four nights a week, I was drinking too much. And so it was brought to my attention by a boyfriend and also by family members, you know, we think you're drinking too much. So I quit, which is logically the thing you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to quit drinking when you're drinking too much. But what I didn't know is that causes what's known as the alcohol deprivation effect. So your brain is now deprived of something. You've been feeding it on a regular basis. Your neural pathways are engorged. It's used to getting ethanol on a certain regular pattern. And now it's not getting it. So what does it do? First month or so, you're fine. You know, you're, you're saying, well, I feel great at being sober. This is something that can work. Then the cravings start coming in. The thoughts about alcohol. 
you know, you see your friend drinking, you smell it, you, you see a movie where someone's drinking red wine or whatever. Then you start physically craving. Like now you can't get it off your mind and you're, you're uncomfortable in your skin. So you say to yourself, well, I've been sober for two months. I don't have a problem. And you have a drink. That's what this little trickster in your brain tells you. You're fine. You've been sober for two months. You don't have an alcohol problem. Have one. And then that one turns into you coming home with a bottle two nights later. And that comes into you opening up your wine cellar again. That's what happened to me. And now drinking heavier than you did before. Mm. So I went from being a light drinker to a social drinker to a heavier drinker to a binge drinker. And when I became a binge drinker at that point in my late 30s, my life was broken down until I found the Sinclair method in 2009. My life was literally broken down into how many binges did I have that year? How long did I manage to have sobriety? And so that is not a pleasant place to live because while you're sober, you're craving. While you're binging, you're miserable. So Claudia, let me ask you this. I see two things here. One, I see the, 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 if, we, uh, if we're running a company, you want to get to the deepest issue. The deepest issue is what started it. And then once you're in too deep, then how do you address it at that point? So let's go back to the start, the, how it got started, and then we'll go into the deeper issue. So, so social light, heavy binge, social light, heavy binge. When you started going through the phase of collecting the wines and you got your own collection and partiers and all this stuff, how much of it was due to association? How much of it was due to industry? And how much of it was it because you're a star, you're on TV, you're everywhere, you're making money, your lifestyle's different. So there are certain things that comes with, hey, I'm making money and let me kind of, uh, this is what rich people do. And the reason why I ask this is because, you know, most of our audience, they're entrepreneurs, they're business people. So these are folks that are also experienced in the same thing. You start off early, then you got a little bit of success, then you got some neighbors, they got some newer things. So how do you think most people who get into this and get addicted, how do you think that habit begins? I Well, I believe it, you just nailed it. It's a habit. So what happens is you you start partying with your friends, but you notice that your friends stop and switch to coffee at 11 o'clock at night. Or maybe your friend goes, no, you know what? I've had enough. I'm going to have a glass of water. But you you don't stop. I was the last girl at the bar going, come on, let's have Zambuca shots at this point. I didn't know what an end was. An end was me just going to bed. And okay. so that's not normal, but nobody in those days pointed out, you know, hey, Claudia, we've all stopped drinking now. You don't need another drink because nobody really noticed. It was just, she's the girl who keeps drinking. Yep. And there's always another guy who keeps drinking. So then I'm drinking with that guy. It wasn't like I was the only one that didn't have an off button. Right. So, so that it normalizes it. And now, of course, hindsight is always clearer. I, it's completely not normal to drink four nights a week, two bottles of wine. That's not normal use of alcohol. <laughs> That's just not normal, especially alone, drinking alone. Well, then you can justify it and say, well, but I, I'm a wine connoisseur or, you know, this is what they do in Europe. Well, no, it's not what they do in Europe. In Europe, they have small glasses of wine with a meal. You know, in America, we have these large pours of, you know, of, of, of wine and yep. we drink for every occasion for a baby shower, for this, for that. There's alcohol everywhere in the United States, always. You know, we call England and Australia drinking cultures. We are a drinking culture. So for me, it didn't seem like it was terribly obvious until somebody said to me, you know, you drink really quickly. Now, mind you, this is coming from a boyfriend I'm dating who drinks a ton himself. So once again, the defensiveness of somebody saying, well, wait a minute, you're drinking as much as I am. Right. And he's saying, well, yeah, but I drink slower than you and I'm bigger than you and you, you keep up with me. And it's, it's kind of weird. I've never seen a woman drink as much as you. And I'm like, well, I have a big tolerance. I'm Irish and German. You know, you know all of these things. Right. When you're in it, there's no way you can look outside yourself and say, oh, that's the hallmark of alcoholism. Claudia, you need help. You know, you don't, you, you're defensive, you're justifying it. You know, I can look back now and say, wow, okay, there were clear signs, but of course you don't see them yourself. That's where people are right now. The thing I ask people is this, is alcohol adversely affecting any part of your life? That can mean anything from your relationships to working out in the morning. Is it affecting adversely affecting any part of your life? If the answer is yes, then you need to address it. 
if it's affecting your work, your health, your family, anything. If you have lots of fights with your loved one, you've got to look at what you're consuming and how much. And, and how is it serving you? How is alcohol serving you? If you don't ask yourself those questions, you're never going to be able to identify if you have a problem or not. The challenge is, you know, if you're aware of it when you're in it. So let me let me ask a different question from you, since this is your world that you've spent a lot of time studying. You said 20 times relapsing and you tried every single method that you went through, even some of the methods you went through where one of them was shaming you and they finally gave you the medicine. You're like, I can't wait to get the hell out of here. You eventually leave. So you know the different formats on what people are saying. The question becomes the following. H how much, uh, like when I look at uh, my, my personality, my wiring, I'm very obsessive. I know my wiring. Like I know I have to sit in a certain place if I go to a restaurant and if I don't sit there, I'm not gonna eat at the restaurant, I leave. That's my wiring. I can't help myself. I've been like this since uh since i was a, uh, a kid so how much uh how much of the individual getting addicted has to do with them as their personality and wiring how much of it is an upbringing and how much of it is escaping reality so so dna upbringing escape and reality I think genetics play a big part of it, but to give you an example, um, out of three siblings in my family, two became addic addicts and one did not. So how do you explain? We have the same genetics and one escaped it. Was it because he's stronger or has more willpower or is it because he didn't actually get that particular gene or is it because he was so busy with his particular line of work that he could not engage in drinking as much as I did. So he didn't develop an alcohol use disorder. That's this was the engineer? This was the engineer? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so you have two siblings with the same child, sort of the same childhood. They're older than me, so they had different experiences and I left home earlier. But a similar upbringing and similar genetics. My belief is definitely that socio influences are huge. Okay, also trauma. My brothers weren't raped, you know, but one of my brothers watched my other brother die. That's major trauma. Wow. Uh, major trauma. The third sibling perhaps didn't have as much trauma. Who knows, you yeah. know? I mean, so, so you, have, you have somebody who witnessed a death at a very young age. You have somebody who was molested at a very young age. And then you have somebody who had, you know, a, a rough time with his interpersonal relationships within his family, but didn't have that kind of, that raw trauma. So maybe that's why he dodged the bullet. I don't know. This is something that I've certainly been observant. And I always ask people, by the way, speaking of your, your obsessive need to sit places, it's interesting because people with OCD and eating disorders quite often do develop a substance use disorder as well, because it is their way to control the circumstances. They cannot control what's going on in their life. So they self-medicate or they purge or they starve themselves in order to control their surroundings. Now, it's a very easy thing to say, oh, that person drank because they, they lived through a war. PTSD, yes, absolutely. Trauma, yes, absolutely. People do self-medicate for those reasons, mm -hmm. but it's not that cut and dry. There are people who are biological addicts, meaning that they simply have the genetics, they engaged in the behavior, and now they're addicted. Now, I always search for something more, but quite honestly, I've met people who, once they take this, they use this method and they get rid of the biological issue, they're, they're pretty good. I mean, they move on in their life. They used to mm -hmm. have a drinking issue. They're not self-medicating for trauma or anything like that. Um, but, but, you know, each individual is different. Every single person drinks for a different reason and they're wired differently. So you can't, there's no one fixed treatment for every single person. And I'm not here to espouse one treatment or say that this doesn't sure, work. Sure, of course. Because I'm a firm believer in whatever works for you yeah. is the right method for you. The only thing for me, it's it's just what triggers it. That That's what I'm curious about. Is there is there a... combination of things. I mean, it's, right. it's also, it's also the, every time you drink, you are learning the behavior. Your neural pathways become more and more engorged and wider and wider and bigger and bigger until they're super highways. And now... Mm -hmm. You're physically dependent on alcohol. Mm. That's, that's the, the course. So you've got people walking around with little country roads for neural pathways. And when they take a drink, they don't get that massive endorphin reinforcement that alcoholics do. Yeah. So of course you don't want to stop drinking because it 
feel so good. Some people take a drink of alcohol and they go, I don't know what the big deal is. I don't, I mean, I like the taste of beer, but I don't, I don't, they don't get a reinforcement. They don't get the reward that addicts do. Does that make sense? Of course it does. Of course it does. So, but uh, I know your father, I believe your father was a surgeon, but was, was your father a surgeon? No, no, that's wrong on Wikipedia or wherever the hell that is on that was some, somebody put misinformation out there. No. My grandfather was a surgeon and a cancer researcher. Um, and I have a lot of doctors in my uh, family, but my father was uh, with Shallow Oil Company actually uh, for the majority of his career. He was in oil business. How about your mom? My mother was in retail and uh, uh, fashion her whole life um, uh, and had her own store and worked at Giorgio's and Beverly Hills and um, very nice. successful in that world, very into clothes and so forth. Um, so yeah. home was pretty stable. Your your home was pretty stable where you were. No, my home wasn't stable at all. When I was eight years old, my brother was killed. I mean, that that doesn't and it resulted in my parents divorce. I mean, uh, the, you know, so that fractured our family intensely. Plus, we moved around all the time. Got my dad it. transferred constantly. So I had no, you know, friends. I had was always the new girl, uh, you know, and there was, um, you know, I I lost my father last year. And I loved him to pieces, but he was a, and he will admit it, he was a tough, tough father. And there was no love lost between my parents. There were, you know, affairs and so forth. So it's, it's, it, it was not an I idyllic childhood at all, but did I have a roof over my head and braces on my teeth? Absolutely. And do I, do I say that I'm better off than, than most children out there? Absolutely. I had, I had a home and I got to go to school and, and I was fed. <laughs> That's huge. So I'm well, great. Sorry, for sorry for your loss. I mean, you know, when it's a year, it's a year, and it's it's uh, uh, my condolences goes out to you and your family. But uh, you know, there's a movie that when you were painting a picture, it just took me to straight to a movie. I had my I, I watched certain movies with my boys, my nine year old and my seven year old son. My daughter's four, so I don't watch some of the movies with them. We watched two weeks ago, Walk the Line, and I'm sure you've seen Walk the Line. You yeah. know, with uh, Joaquin Phoenix and uh, the story of Walk Johnny Cash. Yeah. And, and you see how Johnny in the story, how he had that one traumatic event with his uh, brother on what happened there and then how it haunted him for the rest of his life until eventually he was free and he was able to move on from it. Most people don't know everybody's story. So this is why sometimes I wonder if there is a connection to a place that if you don't address that, you're going to constantly be escaping to something, whether your source is going to be alcohol, sex, cocaine, pot, drugs ecstasy, whatever it may be, to have some kind of an escape, uh, 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 you know, and, and that's one of the reasons why I was asking a question where does a person need to go to a place where you accept your life? Listen, I've had a screwed up life. There's nothing to be embarrassed of. Having said that, there's no need to escape this. And if I do, there's a different way of escaping it so I can move on. So does that come first or is a medicine I need to take to figure out a way to drop alcohol or whatever other addiction that I have? That's a great question. I, my belief is let's get rid of the cravings so that you can focus on therapy. <laughs> you know, let's take the medicines to reduce the drinking so you're clear-minded. You can listen to your therapist. You can let those feelings bubble over you. You can let the emotions come up. If you're still drinking, actively drinking and self-medicating with drugs or alcohol, how are you going to grow as a human being? Mm. So let's address the biological issue of addiction first and concurrently at the same time work on the emotional reasons and the traumatic reasons why the person drank. But first, we need to get them out of the state of being actively in the disease. Got it. So let's get into the you know different methods that you had, and then if you can tell us more about the Sinclair method. So maybe walk us through you know when you said I tried this, I tried that, I tried this. What what were some of the methods, and then tell us about TSM, the Sinclair method. Well, the first thing I did was what everybody uh, pretty much said to do is to go to an AA meeting, and I, you know, I have. Uh, I have utter respect for AA helping the people it helped, but for me, it didn't do anything. It made me want to drink. I mean, I'm sitting in a meeting with a bunch of people talking about drinking and how it ruined their lives. I still walked out of there with cravings, with with anxiety. Um, so it didn't. I didn't feel gelled, and I also didn't like being called powerless as a woman. I really hated that. I, I thought. I, I thought. You know what? I'm not powerless. I come from a family of physicians. I know that there must be something to fix this. I'm not going to relegate myself to being an alcoholic for the rest of my life. 
I want to be able to say I used to be an alcoholic. So this isn't working for me. So that was AA. Then I went to a rehab facility where, you know, you're locked in a place with people with everything going on, eating disorders, heroin addiction, cocaine, sex addiction, porn, I mean, everything. And we're denied alcohol, obviously. And we talk about our childhoods, but then we get out in the real world. There's no preparation for being in the real world. There's nobody telling me how to identify a trigger or a, 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 what is a, a memory, how to, a toolbox to deal with, with triggers so you don't drink. I mean, there was no preparation for mm. the real world. So yeah, we're sober when we're in there. There. But the second you get out, you relapse. So I relapsed very quickly after that very expensive rehab that I thought was a bit ridiculous. Um, then I tried uh, psychotherapy. So I went to a therapist who was convinced that my drinking was all to do with childhood trauma. Okay, interesting concept, but no, absolutely no appreciation of the biological aspect of addiction. So she's treating, she's trying to treat this trauma, trauma, trauma not knowing that all talking about it is just triggering me. Once again, I'm not given tools to deal with those cravings or with anything else. Mm -hmm. I'm just sent out after the hour and a half of talking about my childhood, wanting to drink. Because <laughs> that's my go-to mechanism for self-medicating to not let the feelings bubble Got up. It. So she didn't prepare me in any way, shape or form for, for triggers or, or cravings or anything like that. And I'm not blaming her. She wasn't an addiction therapist. I should have gone to a specialist in addiction. The, the next thing I tried was hypnotherapy because I heard that it helped some people. Um, that lasted about a week. I was like, wow, I don't feel like drinking. And then a week later I felt like drinking. So that only lasted about a week. Um, and every time I would do an, an episode, like a, a expensive hypnotherapy session, it would last less and less time. So it was a week and then six days and then five days. So that, um, I tried, uh, uh, oh, I tried vitamin therapy because I was told that, I mean, I researched and realized that the brain is lacking things when you abuse alcohol, that you need certain vitamin Bs and certain um, supplements that will, uh, that will help maintain uh, equilibrium in, in your brain. So I went into that whole vitamin thing, diet thing, exercise plan, and I thought I can do this holistically. The cravings were still there, you know, but so I, you know, I couldn't change my brain. That's the, eventually, um, I went to my first and only medical detox in 2009, uh, because I was really afraid I was going to stroke out. I was doing what I thought was healthy. And that was just going cold Turkey. I didn't know about tapering from alcohol. I didn't know that it was really dangerous to go cold Turkey. Cause every time I would have a binge, I just stop. I, I would just stop and go cold Turkey and recover from the binge. Well, this time, as I was recovering from the binge, I, I really started feeling like I couldn't control my body. So it was really scary because I had heard about people stroking out. So I called a friend, they took me to this medical detox and it was a, once again, a horrific experience, experience. And on the way out, I saw some flyers for various treatments for alcoholism. And I gathered them all up and took them home and looked at them. And one of them said, it stops cravings for alcohol. And I thought, well, that's my problem. It's the cravings, the mental and physical cravings. So if I could just do that, that's great. So I researched it and it was a shot called Vivitrol and I researched it and there was a lot of, a lot of bad reviews online and talking about low grade depression and how it doesn't really target the alcohol uh, in, a, in a great way. So I looked at what the ingredient was and it was naltrexone. So I Googled naltrexone and up popped this book called The Cure for Alcoholism. And I was like, yeah, right, Cure for Alcoholism. But I read it, read the free chapter that they had online and I read it and it seemed really intriguing. So I looked, I said, you know what? I'm gonna try to get this medication. I called my GP and he said, I'm not giving you an opiate. <laughs> when I went in, I made the appointment, I went in and I said, no, it's not an opiate, it's an opiate blocker. Uh, he still refused me because he didn't, he had never used it on a patient, even though it's FDA approved, it was totally safe, it's proven its efficacy. But at that point, it was, it was always um, given to an individual with, with abstinence, but he wouldn't even give it to me for that. So I had to order it online. So I ordered the packet of pills from India from a pharmacy online, which was nerve wracking and I thought illegal. And I received those pills after quite a long time. I think I had three months of sobriety under my belt by the time they came. 
And I had ordered the book in the meantime, The Cure for Alcoholism. I had read the whole book. I had done some research. And I thought, okay, either I'm, this is going to work or I'm going to die because the next binge is going to kill me because the last one was so horrific. That, you know, binges get worse as they, as they come on. That's how people die of alcohol poisoning. And it worked. I took that pill. I waited an hour and I drank maybe a couple of sips of wine and I just wasn't interested. I tried it a few more times. My body started getting used to the medication. I started drinking more like I did in my 20s. And at about the four month mode uh, month, I had my, what I call my aha moment. I talk about it in my TEDx talk. I was driving down the road and I saw this billboard for wine. And normally that would trigger me to want to drink. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and my brain said, that's a billboard with a glass of red wine on it. It didn't have any other effect on me other than registering what the billboard was. And that to me, I, I was the moment where I went, oh my God, I'm done. I'm done with, with that obsession and that compulsive disorder of my brain. I felt normal. I would go whole days and realize I had not thought of drinking. That was something that I hadn't experienced in almost a decade. Wow. So, so to, 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 there's no other way to describe it, but to realize on a Thursday that you have not thought about drinking since you drank on Sunday evening, it makes you want to cry because prior to that, Every day I was either fighting for my sobriety, white knuckling through every minute of the day, pushing down the thoughts of booze, or I was actively in a binge. So that, that was profound. And when that happened to me, I wrote to the editor, I mean, the um, publisher of the book. And I said, listen, I want to contact this man who wrote this because he saved my life. And they allowed me to contact Dr. Roy Escapa and I said, you know, I'm not a big star. I, I'm, I'm a working actress, but you know, I'm not really well known. I have a little group of fans that are sci-fi fans that, that are pretty much worldwide. You know, there are millions of people that love Babylon 5. Maybe I could help in some way, but you know, I'm not a Brad Pitt or something. I'm just Claudia. And he said, why don't you write a book? And that's that's why I wrote Babylon Confidential. And when that came out in 2012, I said, you know what? It didn't reach enough people. This is a visual society. I'm going to make a movie. So I made one little pill, my documentary. And mm -hmm. that came out in 2014. It's available on Amazon for free if anybody wants to watch it or onelittlepillmovie.com. And then at that point, concurrently, I said, you know what? We need a nonprofit organization. I need to run it to give everybody the information that I needed when I was suffering so they don't have to order pills from India. And at that point, in 2013, there was one doctor in the United States that was willing to use TSM with his, with his patients, one doctor. And now today in 2021, the entire United States is covered, all of Canada, all of Australia, New Zealand, most of Europe and the UK. Amazing to have gone through that process. And it's, it's almost as if you did market research for others who are going through it because you tried so many different ways. Claudia, a question for you about, you gave feedback to the person that's going through it, how to handle it. What feedback could you give to somebody that has a loved one who is currently at the binge phase and they don't know how to get out of it? What does a loved one do to help that person, you know, transition out and be free? First of all, you, 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 and this is really hard to understand. It's funny. I just did a Twitch. We have a Twitch channel that we, every Wednesday we do subjects and yesterday's was shame and how important it is for a loved one to know this is not about you. And that's really hard to do. So when a person says, my husband is choosing to drink over our relationship, yeah. you, have to under, you have to eliminate that from your thought process because the people who've gone through addiction, this is not a choice. Nobody is asked for this to happen. This is not his fault. So let's start there and start with love and support and say, look, I want to help you. And I've heard about this method that involves drinking. It's not an excuse to drink, but it undoes addiction in the brain. I think this would maybe work for you. And I would love if, if you would be willing to try it. And let's watch one little pill so you get an idea of the science behind it. That's why I made that movie. So loved ones can sit down with the person who's suffering and say, look, I'm not judging you. I'm just excited about this thing I heard about. Are you willing to watch this documentary with me? 
And if you are interested in doing TSM, I will help you. That's a loving way, a supportive way of saying to a loved one, I recognize you're in pain. Just like you told your friend, I recognize you're in pain. And I don't know what to do for you, but I'd love to learn about this method. It might help you. And then do it together. If, they, if they're coherent enough at that point to watch the documentary, watch it with them. If they're not, you watch it on your own. Go to c3foundation.org, look at our free resources. This person can get as much or as little help as they need. They can join free online meetings. There's a whole community out there of people on the Sinclair Method. There's literally thousands of people all around the world that, that, that do meetings, that have a, a forum, Facebook pages. This is not something new or unproven. This is, you know, naltrexone has been around since the early 90s, used for alcohol use disorder. But it's only within the last maybe decade that doctors are realizing it's better used in a targeted manner. That means taking it an hour before you drink. So if you're in the UK, by the way, and you or Europe and you get nalmaphene, you have to wait two hours, but that's a whole other subject. There's two drugs that treat this, nalmaphene and naltrexone. In the United States, you're bound to get, you are going to get naltrexone. And it has many different generic brands of naltrexone. So you might get Revia, you might get Nodict, it's all 50 milligram naltrexone for treating alcohol use disorder. So people can find a provider on my page, they can, they can find whatever they need. So for loved ones, we also even have a loved one for loved ones Facebook page, so they get the support they need. Most important thing to do is to no threatening. Great. That's a great page. Y yes, we have, a, we have a Facebook page just for loved ones, because that is a whole, to watch your loved one killing yourself is unbearable. Yep. And I have people say, I don't understand why my son just can't quit. It's a reflection on the parent if the child is not doing well. And so all sorts of things come in, ego, embarrassment, shame. My daughter's an addict, my son's a junkie. You know, all of these words that we hear, it's, it's mortifying for the parent. So they, they react quite often with anger. Yep. And one thing that I can attest to that doesn't work when you're in the throes of addiction is anger. If somebody's angry at you or they shame you, you're just more likely to drink more. And we don't want to create that environment. We want to create a really safe communication line with the loved one. So we want to tell the loved one, you know, just say, I know you're hurting and I want to help you. And I, you know, I saw this actress talking about this. Here, let's watch her TED talk. You know, just slowly bring the idea up. And if that person is motivated to change, then TSM is a great method for them. If they're not ready, you can't force them to take the pill and wait the hour. So this is not a method for somebody to force on somebody. You cannot force a loved one to do this. This method is for people who've tried other methods, who other treatment modalities have failed, who are at their wits end and who are really motivated to comply with the medication. Because if you don't comply, it ain't gonna work. Very, very important topic. I'm, I'm so uh, thankful that you came out to uh share your testimony with the rest of us. I highly recommend folks, you go visit her website. We're going to put the link below as well as the book you wrote. I'll put the link below second. We'll put the foundation at the top first. Claudia, I'll give you the final thoughts here. Is there anything else you want to share with the viewer uh, based on the conversation we've had today on Valuetainment? I just want to say, if you know someone who's suffering or if you're suffering yourself, please, please don't give up. This method works for the majority of people who try it. It has over like an 80% long-term success rate. Um, when you have really good care and support, it goes upwards to 90% long-term success rate. So you have a really good opportunity to get your life back if you're suffering right now. And, and if, if it is a loved one, try and employ the methods that we discussed of being kind and loving and just giving them the support they need and giving them this, this information, this life-saving information. That's my last thought on the subject. And I appreciate you having me on here. Every single time somebody hears this spoken about, a life is saved. Just know that you are saving lives right now because you know I cannot tell you how many people reach out and say, oh, I saw you on this or I heard that podcast, you saved my life. No, you're saving lives because you're having me on here. So I thank you for that opportunity. Oh, anytime. This is a very important matter. And if we can collectively uh, make it an impact in somebody else's life, we did our part right. So once again, thank you so much for being a guest on Valuetainment. Appreciate you. Thank you. Take care.
you probably know somebody that's dealing with the issue that she was dealing with. Everybody almost knows somebody that's dealing with alcoholism or some other kind of addiction that they have. And I've seen many people's lives being taken due to not knowing how to deal with it, nor do the family members and loved ones knowing how to deal with them that is going through the challenge right now. So I'm curious to know your thoughts. Comment below. And if you enjoyed this interview, I think you would enjoy another interview I did with uh, Daniel Lieberman. Similar topics, different issues. Click over here to watch the interview. And uh, with that being said, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.